Well, ladies and gentlemen, why don't we get started? Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center. My name is Jeff DeBelko, and I'm fortunate enough to direct the Environmental Change and Security Program here at the Wilson Center. We appreciate all you hardy souls who braved the weather. It doesn't take much in Washington in terms of snow to shut things down, as we've seen today, as all our, those of us with young kids are sent scampering to find means to uh, cover all that. Fortunately, I uh, got the longer stick and wasn't the one who had to run home. Uh, so I'm pleased to be here today because I think we're going to have a fascinating discussion of a, 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 a book that I think we can still call new. It, it's not out there just in the last few weeks or even a couple of months, but one that um, is really, I think, making a, a, a very um, critical difference in the discussion on demography. It's entitled The Graying of Great Powers, Demography and Geopolitics in the 21st Century. And uh, we're very pleased to have Richard Jackson and Neil Howe, who were uh, the authors of that book, here today to discuss um, issues of demography and security, something that we've tried to facilitate discussion and debate on here at the Woodrow Wilson Center for some years. Um, allow me just a word to say about kind of where we are and to set the context for this kind of discussion that we're having today. Um, the Wilson Center is the formal memorial to Woodrow Wilson. He was our only president, for better or for worse, who had a Ph.D. And so Congress in 1968 saw fit to set up a memorial that would bring these two worlds together in a, in a living memorial uh, where scholars and practitioners and policymakers could come together, try to learn from one another and improve each other's endeavors. And so that's what uh, we have done uh, since 1968 and with our program specifically since 1994, where we have focused initially on environment security and then um, in fairly short order broadened it to include issues of development and population demography and health and understand that in a broader development foreign policy and security policy context and so uh, obviously the topic of today fits squarely uh, in that center um, it is something we try to do with facilitating exactly this kind of thing, finding the new um, research and providing a forum for the folks who are doing that work, uh, but who have a very clearly an eye on the kind of the policy and the practitioner world and engage other scholars and engage policy practitioner and media in these kinds of discussions. And so we're very pleased uh, to be doing that today. I'll mention as part of that effort, uh, we have obviously the folks in the room, but we're now, um, uh, not increasingly, but almost for all our meetings, we are broadcasting them live on the web. And then the archive video of that is available so that you can direct other people to share the benefits of the insights that were discussed here. Um, and so we urge you to go to the Wilson Center website um, to take advantage of this and, and encourage you to um, gain these insights in various multimedia form as we, as we move forward. Um, so I'll, I'll say uh, a word about Richard and, and Neil, um, and then also Jen Shuba, who's uh, been a longtime friend of the program, who's going to uh, provide uh, a, a few comments on both the topic and the, and the book uh, and share some of in her insights from her research and, and her work uh, in government. Um, so Richard Jackson and, and Neil Howe are both associated with the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Richard is directing, currently a senior fellow, and directs the Global Aging Initiative. Um, I think it's uh, one of the reasons that we were very keen to have the two of them come here. We've had many, many sessions in this forum about um, rapid population growth rates and security connections. I think what's uh, very valuable is they are diversifying the agenda and the topics that we're focusing on, and aging has been a discussion that's gone on, but largely not. Those two groups have not come together, and so I think it's a real contribution that they've made to bringing these things together. And so um, it's terrific that, A, CSIS has an aging a global aging initiative and that Richard is providing the leadership there. Neil Howe is an economist, demographer, and historian who's worked on this, also associated with the Global Aging Initiative. Um, and as you can see from the bios that we've passed out, these gentlemen have both spent a long time thinking about both the demographic side and the security side, so really bringing these, bringing these worlds together. Uh, Jen Shuba is the Mellon Environmental Fellow in the Department of International Studies at Rhodes College. Um, I got to know Jen when she was here in town, and we were, in fact, a ways back, both in the same PhD program out at the University of Maryland, where she was looking at demography issues and foreign policy and security, uh, but also because she had a, a stint at the uh, Department of Defense Office uh, of Policy Planning, OSD Policy Planning, where she was responding to all sorts of requests um, 
uh, regarding environment and demography in the security context. And so she has both the academic hat and some, to some degree the uh, sitting on the inside from the security and how these issues are brought together. So we asked Jen to, to join us to make a few comments. This session, like many that we do in the Environmental Change and Security Program, are uh, made is made possible with um, uh, support from uh, USAID, Agency for National Development, and their Office of Population and Reproductive Health. So obviously um, a topic that is um, right on for some of the things that they have been looking at. Uh, so I'm going to turn the floor over to Neil to kick us off for a presentation, the two of them, and Jen some remarks. And then when we go to the q and I'll ask, because it is being webcast, that um, we'll bring you a microphone and you can pose your question and identify yourself that way so the folks online can, can hear it as well. So Neil, please, the floor is yours. There we go. Great. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you all for coming. I know that in the, the contest between snow and demography, demography usually loses. Uh, but we're, we're very appreciative of, uh, of the attention to, to the set of issues, which um, more than anything else allows us to look into our long-term future. There are very few things we know about the world 50 years from now, but one of, them, one of the things we knew to know is that five-year-olds today will be 55-year-olds then and, you know, and, uh, and so on with other age brackets. And this allows us, I think, to actually do something so ambitious as to look into the future. Um, just to summarize quickly what we're going to do this morning, uh, go through some of the high points of our book, or at least some of the major themes that we cover. Uh, first, the purpose, scope, and assumptions of, of our book, this one. I think it's out there, uh, out, out near the door. Uh, the purpose is to look at uh, the impact of demography on geopolitics and from the viewpoint of the, uh, the developed world generally and from the United States specifically. That was actually part of our project as we defined it and, in fact, as it was funded. Uh, the scope was to look into the next 50 years. So generally most of our projections go from 2005 to 2050. And our assumptions uh, for the demography, and Richard can talk with a lot more detail if you have more questions about that, but are basically the United Nations assumptions, uh, the constant fertility rate assumptions for the developed world, and in fact for all countries with uh, TFR, total fertility rate of uh, 2.35 or less. and uh, uh, and the high assumptions for all the other countries. So uh, not pretty much, or at least close to, uh, the, the, uh, the mainline UN assumptions. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to talk about the trends in the U.S. and other developed countries, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the, what these trends mean on the ability uh, of the developed world to maintain security th 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 through the world. Uh, Richard is then going to talk about the developing world, the perils of transition, and he's going to end a little bit uh, with a little bit of discussion on what we consider the likely critical decade, the 2020s, when a lot of the problems we see both in the developed world and the developing world will, uh, will accelerate or at least reach a, uh, 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 what, a sort of a decisive, um, decisive impact uh, and will come together in, 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 in in possibly urgent, urgent ways. I know, you know, we're in the middle of a bad recession, a financial crisis, and a fiscal crisis, which look, looks like it's going to take us into the next decade, the 20 teens. So a lot of us are looking to the decade after that as a breather. Uh, but, but it looks as though, for at least dem demographically, the 2020s is going to be. <coughs> Uh, is, 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 is going to be very challenging. We also have a framework for policy action, uh, but we'll probably leave that for the Q&A if anyone wants to know about that. In other words, where we think we ought to go uh, in terms of not just future research, but also uh, uh, what we think our, our study implies for uh, both domestic and uh, f uh, foreign policies of the developed world. So let me get started. Uh, the projections themselves. Uh, the whole world is aging, and the developed countries are leading the way. And I'm gonna, not going to dwell too much on this because some of this is familiar, but I think it's worth reviewing. Uh, as many of us know, uh, the, you can see the developed world is, if you just look at the population age 65 and over, you're going to see a constant increase accelerating, as you see, particularly in the 2020s, 
in the share of the population that's 65 and older. The developing world is aging too, but delayed uh, and somewhat behind, at least on average. Some developing countries, obviously, like uh, most remarkably China, uh, will be develop uh, will be aging uh, much faster. Um, and here we can see within the developed world uh, uh, these dramatic jumps uh, you can see between 2005 and, and 2050. There are two forces driving this aging. Uh, one is falling fertility rates, which generally decreases the number of people who are young in the population, and rising longevity, which of course increases the share of the, popul that's the population that's old. Contrary to, to uh, maybe common sense assumption, falling fertility actually is the is the dominant contributor to this trend. It's actually more important than rising longevity. Uh, but both of them are contributing. Some, Japan, for instance, which has very long longevity, it's contributing a little bit more uh, uh, in another country, somewhat less. Here you can see the contribution of lower fertility. Back in the early 1960s, uh, nearly every country was sizably above replacement rate fertility uh, throughout the uh, developed world. Uh, at least here we see the, the big eight, or I should say the big seven, uh, uh, and as you can see today, all of them are below, or in the case of the U.S., just barely equal to replacement rate fertility. It's interesting to note, too, that this is not a recent trend. Uh, Japan has been si way below replacement rate fertility for about 40 years. Uh, so this isn't just, you know, just, just very recently. Uh, number, most of these countries have been considerably be below repl replacement rate for at least 30 years. And, of course, rising life expectancy, which should be familiar to all of us. And um, uh, due to uh, diet and lifestyle and other reasons, you can see some, uh, some countries are excelling more in this area than others. Uh, the U.S., interestingly, despite all that we spend on health care, is not a leader in this area. Uh, populations in, in most developed countries will not only age, but stagnate or decline. And this is really inevitable. With countries with below replacement rate fertility, absent sizable immigration, dramatic uh, rates of immigration, you are going to see ultimately population decline. This is looking at our projections. Uh, you can see, and, and you can see a real difference here. The U.S., which will continue to be growing, uh, Canada, France, uh, UK, here we see just kind of breaking even. And then, of course, uh, uh, Italy, uh, uh, Germany, and Japan, you'll be seeing sizable declines. And here you see, of course, the declines are larger with the working age population because they exclude the old. A little bit less dramatic if you look at the entire population. This is as close as social science comes to a certain prediction about the future. I emphasize that because people sometimes say, well, these are long-term projections. How do you know what's going to happen in 2050? Um, uh, as I said before, uh, anyone uh, uh, older than age 50 in the year 2050 can actually be counted today. They're already alive. Uh, everyone younger is going to be born, but typically fertility rates do not change dramatically. And there's something called demographic momentum. Even if fertility rates were to change dramatically, it will take a long time for them to sizably impact the long-term population trajectory because the younger cohorts are so much smaller now. It took a long time of lo low fertility to cause the kind of population decline we're now seeing. And similarly, it would require a very long reversal to reverse the overall trend in population. Well, what are the consequences for the developed countries? Again, I'm going to look at this, and then later on, Richard is going to I'll look a little bit at the, developing, at the developing world. The overall outlook, the population and GDP of the developed world will see a steady decline as a share of the world total. Uh, population share will go down gradually. Uh, again, you can see more dramatic for the rest of the developed world from the U.S., but you can see... Uh, a decline in the, in the world share. Obviously, the developing world would be growing as a share. Similarly, uh, GDP will, share will be down more uh, sharply uh, due to the fact that, uh, again, due to due the, the, the uh, uh, greater decline in the working age population, plus assumptions about productivity growth and standard of living growth in the developing versus the developed world. Again, you can see more dramatic in the rest of the developed world than for the United States. 
population and GDP of the United States will be steadily rising as a share of the developed world. I think this is interesting, and, and there's been a lot of declinism about the role of the United States in the developed world, but this is rather an interesting, um, rather interesting trend to reflect upon. Uh, the, uh, you can see is here that the population will be steadily rising as a share of the developed world, and, and as will the GDP. And in fact, by the mid-2020s or late-2020s, our share of the developed world GDP, and defining the developed world very conventionally, the way we've defined it since the early post-war era, uh, our share will be as large as it was right after World War II, you know, the sort of the Pax Americana when, when the United States seemed to be uh, such an important economic player in the world. English, uh, the population in English-speaking countries will be 58% by the year 2050, up from only 42% today. U.S. GDP will exceed 1950 share by 2025, something I already mentioned. Uh, reordering of the largest nation roster. This is fascinating. This is something the UN has actually been doing uh, uh, for about eight or nine years now. They've been actually doing these projections. Uh, this is the you can see two of these are not projections, it's reality. These are the largest nations in the world by population. You can see in 1950, either the Soviet Union or the developed world occupied seven of the most populous 12 nations. In the year 20, uh, 2005, uh, the, the Soviet Union uh, or Russia and, uh, uh, and, and the developed world occupied only three of the top places. In the year 2050, only the United States will be left, and they will still be in third place. The only changes in the top, of course, is that India and China will reverse places for, for obvious reasons. Interesting, too, take a look at those developed world countries who were in the top 12 in 1950, and look at their place by the year 2050. Look how far down they will be. Interesting way to kind of reflect upon changes in relative importance, and the how interesting how demography, while not dramatic at all year by year, becomes very dramatic decade by decade. Well, what are the consequences? Uh, since we're looking at, at uh, 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 geopolitics, I mean, we're going to look at some of the obvious here. One is military, service age mobilization, what we now call after our experience in Iraq, boots on the ground, right? And uh, uh, this is obvious. This is... Uh, Voltaire once said that God is on the side of the biggest battalions, you know, and uh, Clausewitz once said that numbers are the principal, are the, are, the, are, the, uh, are the most general principle of victory, both strategic and tactical. We've had a long lore that goes back in talking about the importance of population for military, but also non-military. You think of over, over time, over decades, over centuries, the role of migration and occupation, often nonviolent. Uh, you see it today, for instance, in looking at... Uh, uh, Koreans, Mongolians, Chinese moving into the eastern part of Russia, which is demographically declining now. Mo many of the most important demographic changes historically occur nonviolently. Um, here, by the way, is interesting. We added to this uh, uh, the look not just at working age population, but in recruitment age population. You see, the younger you go, the more dramatic the population decline figure. In Japan, for example, a minus 47 percent uh, halving of recruitment age population between 2005 and 2050. The foregone advantages of economic size. Uh, geopolitically, this is well recognized. Military, obviously, logistics, training, weaponry, uh, spending on uh, investment, uh, uh, plant, equipment, uh, R&D. Non-military, international transfers, commercial financial leverage, economies of scale. Uh, Edward Dennison, who for many years worked over at Brookings, did all of those uh, studies of the causes of productivity growth. He rated economies of scale for the United States during the 20th century almost as important as capital formation as a reason for productivity growth uh, uh, in the United States uh, over, you know, since 1929. A further aging constraint, obviously, is projected fiscal crowding out. And I just want to look at this. I, uh, this compares in all of the uh, big seven uh, developed countries current spending on defense with simply the increase in old age benefits between 2005 and 2030 and 2005 and 2050. Okay, The reason we did this was to give you some idea about the likely effects of crowding out in public sector budgets over the next three decades or over the next five decades. 
Uh, it's easy to imagine that those red lines will be squeezed down, and not just defense, obviously, but international aid and various other forms of, uh, of uh, in, uh, uh, engagement with the rest of the world. And the foregone advantages of both uh, population size and economy, the proven record of prevailing in conflict. We actually looked at the history of this in this book. Uh, many studies have been done of this, and the, the, uh, the, the conclusion of almost all scholars is that nations which are both larger and wealthier uh, tend to win, <laughs> almost always, in major, in major conflicts which are of importance to both sides. Uh, multilateral, multilateral leadership is also uh, uh, can can be uh, stronger when you are when you are both larger and wealthier, and your cultural influence, what Joseph Nye calls soft power, uh, redounds to the benefit of the larger player, the player whose culture has more of an impact on a global scale, uh, and and the institutions that play a larger role in organizing world affairs. Um, now I want to talk a little bit more specifically about economic structure and the impact of uh, demography. Obviously, we're going to see falling rates of investment, particularly investment economists called capital broadening investment, investment needed to, to, to uh, uh, serve a larger workforce. Uh, the falling ratio of producers to consumers, the transfer payments to, from people who work to people who don't work will obviously rise, even if we do, for instance, have a rise in retirement age. Uh, and we're going to see a shift of consumption from the young to the old. This is already happening, and we can project, or many economists have tried to project, how much this will continue. Savings rate. Theory and data suggest fall probably more than investment. It will fall because when people get old, they tend to consume rather than save. They consume on the basis of what they had earlier saved. So when you have fewer young people who are saving, more old people are consuming, uh, you tend to get a fall in the savings rate. Now, over the past 10 years, there's been really been a revolution in the research on this subject. It used to be thought that savings would fall a little bit, but investment would fall more, and that these old countries by the middle of the 21st century would still be capital exporters. They'd still be providing plenty of financial aid around the world and exporting in, in developing countries. Recently, with a lot of new research using macro studies, macro level you know, regression analysis, uh, the scholarship has really changed on this. The consensus now is that savings will fall more than investment and that these countries will be capital importers. Uh, this is particularly true when you think of the impact of uh, public sector deficits are likely to have on savings. This is a, a chart we did to show what would happen if the G7 uh, were to, uh, uh, were to uh, finance increases in entitlement programs driven by aging purely through increased debt, is that right? Purely through increased deficit spending. And as you can see, ultimately it will consume the entire G7 net national savings uh, sometime after the year 2030. Global capital, probably a rising inflow, uh, given the need for importing uh, capital, triggering larger and more volatile trade imbalances, rising debt service cost, uh, rising political influences wielded by creditors. Uh, when we started to write this, this was still projection. Now we're actually seeing it played in reality with sovereign wealth funds around the world beginning to dictate to American firms right, on what conditions they will invest in them. Uh, and obviously, ultimately, possibility or fear of default, which will put enormous power in the hands of creditors. Uh, workforce aging. This is a fascinating topic. We did a fair amount of research on it. The ratio of workers over 50 to workers under 30 in the developed world. Fascinating. Uh, rising from nearly doubling from 1980 to the year 2030, but in some countries rising to extraordinary levels. Uh, we reviewed the, the uh, uh, sort of the, the psychological and workforce lit uh, scholarly literature on the impact of aging in the workforce. And what we can deduce from that or infer from a lot of this research is that we, uh, an older workforce is more risk averse. Uh, they're married, they're, they bought large houses, they, they don't move around as well, they don't take as many risks, uh, more of their life is behind them. Uh, and also they're less entrepreneurial. And this is particularly, there's a global entrepreneurial monitor put out by the London School of Economics and all of the countries they research, entrepreneurship is strongly associated with youth. Slight cost in overall productivity, but a large shift in the type of productivity. And for people who do psychometrics, they distinguish between something called fluid and crystallized abilities. Fluid abilities are very strong in the young. They decline very rapidly after about age 30. Crystallized ability, the, 
things like, you know, the take experience using words and things like that are really the strength of the old. But it's very interesting that we're going to see a huge shift toward crystallized and away from fluid intelligence or fluid abilities. And this means that probably the developed world will do best in an era when technology is probably not changing very much. <laughs> I think that r rapid technology change will probably be to the detriment of, a, of an older workforce. Business psychologies, does demographic stasis trigger business pessimism? Um, well, according to uh, uh, you know, Keynes and Lionel Robbins and many of the people who started writing in the 30s, uh, it does. Uh, product markets, uh, when you have demographic stasis, they trigger excess capacity, price wars, and ultimately a strong temptation to form cartels. The problem is, is when you have excess capital, uh, the marginal cost of using more capital is zero. So it, it, it's an invitation to do price wars, and, it's, and it, uh, it, it's unlike a time when you can manage sectoral changes by investing less. It's hard to manage sectoral changes by destroying capital you've already invested. And the same is true for employment. You can have higher labor adjustment costs. Again, when the workforce is static or even declining year by year, and when real GDP is stagnant because even productivity growth is not enough to make up for declining workforce size, you have a situation in which the only way you can adjust between sectors, say if people are buying fewer shoes and more, uh, uh, and, and, and I don't know, more footballs, or you think of different products, the only way you can do it is by firing people in one sector. Uh, whereas when the, when, the market, when the workforce is growing, you can adjust by simply hiring fewer. And this is something that was pointed out in the 1930s when people were obsessed uh, with, with uh, population, uh, uh, lack of population growth. And of course, in all markets, anti-competitive public intervention, probably uh, in the area of trade most of all. And I know that in just in recent weeks that's arisen again, uh, and certainly in the last few months this is bound to be a huge issue just in the next uh, year or two in, in the United States. Uh, changes in the social mood, psychology of aging and social outlook, uh, the age effect, rising, ri rising rigidity and flexibility, which has been studied in, uh, very often in, in phase of life studies about how people think about events, how they think about political ideas, often going back to their coming of age experiences. I find boomers, as they grow older, they keep going back to the 60s, you know. <laughs> it's, uh, and, you know, but there's a longer and longer lag as you grow older. You keep going back to this stuff, and it, it gets worn. There's also, of course, the time horizon effect. This is a rational reason why older people don't look as much to the future. Quite frankly, they don't have as much time left. Uh, it doesn't make much sense to plan when you're older. And it's fascinating to look here. We did a little chart here showing the share of the population in the G7 countries with less than 20 years of life remaining. I thought this was rather interesting. Uh, and, and look, at particularly in, in nations like Japan, you see just a dramatic shift. Shifting family structure. This is going to be fascinating. By, by one calculation, in Italy, by the year 2050, 60% of newborns will have no siblings, no cousins, no, uh, no aunts, no uncles. Uh, you consider what it means to be a very low fertility rate country with a lot of, you know, only, only children. Well, psychological studies have been done, show that fewer siblings and more firstborns mean a, a, a more uh, achievement-oriented workforce, probably a higher, you know, things like IQ and so on are associated with only children, but less social skills, uh, fewer ability to get along in teams. You're going to have a lot of very entitled, uh, uh, achievement-oriented kids running around. Uh, policy impact of weaker extended families. The family historically, the large extended family has served all kinds of social functions such as getting jobs, being a, a, a safety net, uh, uh, providing all kinds of social services informally within extended family members. What's going to happen when you have a whole society of only children? Uh, it, will the government be called on to, to provide more of those services? Growing ethnic and religious diversity. This is a large subject. I don't want to say too much about it here because I, I would consume too much time. But new research on assimilation and social trust we cover in the book and the whole notion of diaspora politics. Obviously, we're going to have large immigration in the developed countries, and these immigrants will be larger as a share of the population given the slow growth of the populations themselves. And finally, aging and electoral politics. Just picking up on that psychology of aging point is an interesting chart. The, uh, 
uh, elderly is a share of the adult population, that is to say roughly a share of the electorate in these countries. Uh, again, dramatic shifts, uh, and that can't help but change the policy agenda, the legislative agenda, uh, and uh, uh, possibly the, the, the future course of these countries. And with that, I'm, I'll turn it over to, to Rich. Very good. Thanks, Neil. Um, yeah, so we, uh, I, I guess I don't need to, to actually be sitting in front of the keyboard with talk about fluid and crystallized intelligence. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I'm going to turn to the uh, developing world um, and the, the, the context, um, obviously, in, in which um, the possibly uh, uh, age, the, the certainly aging and possibly weakening um, developed countries uh, of a decade or two or three from now will be, will be operating. Um, of course, the developed world, uh, as Neil explained, um, is leading the way uh, into this older future, uh, but the developing world is also in the midst of what demographers call the demographic transition. Um, the shift from high fertility and high mortality, the traditional norm, uh, to low fertility and low fort mortality, uh, the modern norm, um, a shift uh, that, that seems to inevitably uh, accompany uh, economic and social uh, development. Um, world, worldwide, uh, let me back up again a second. W worldwide, since um, 1970, uh, the fertility rate has fallen from 5.1. Uh, the the, in the developing world, the fertility rate has fallen from 5.1 to 2.9. The uh, uh, population growth rate um, has dropped from 2.2 percent uh, to 1.3 percent per year, and the median age uh, has risen from, from 20 uh, uh, to 26. So in the developing world as a whole, uh, this, this trend is now well underway. Um, this is obviously at, at a fundamental level uh, uh, a, a cause for, for hope, uh, and, and for optimism um, about the future, and, and for two reasons. Um, uh, for, 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 first of all, there's the window uh, of economic opportunity uh, for economic growth and development that the demographic transition opens up. If I think about it, what's the first thing that happens when, when fertility falls? You have fewer kids to take care of, right? So you free up adult time, and especially the time of women for participation in the market economy. Um, over time, the share of the population uh, in the working years rises, uh, all other things being equal. That translates into higher per capita GDP. Um, as more of the working age population moves into the higher saving middle years, you may get a boost to savings uh, and investment and productivity growth. Um, this dynamic is sometimes called the uh, demographic dividend. Um, there, there's also the, uh, 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 the fading um, of uh, what are often called youth bulges, uh, the unusually large share of the population uh, in the uh, young, volatile young adult uh, age bracket, um, sometimes measured as age 15 to 24, sometimes as age 15 to, to 29. I mean, there's a large literature um, that establishes the, the correlation between uh, extreme youth, uh, violence, um, instability, uh, and, and state failure. Youth bulges are fading uh, 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 in, in, in much of the uh, uh, developing world now. Um, yet, at the same time, uh, the closer we looked at the demographic dynamics um, that are now unfolding, um, we realized uh, uh, that, that these positive developments that in, in the long term may be pushing the world toward greater peace and prosperity, um, in the near term, uh, raise certain concerns. Um, and, and so this optimism has to come along with a couple of caveats. Um, the first caveat 
is that the timing and pace of the demographic transition uh, varies greatly uh, by, by country and region. Um, Fertility has fallen uh, much further uh, in some regions than others. Uh, in fact, in some regions, it's hardly fallen at all. 34% um, of the developing world's population now lives in countries with below replacement fertility. Um, that's up from 5% in 1970. Uh, but 46% still lives, lives in countries where the fertility rate is higher than 3 um, so you have a, a countries moving through the demographic transition uh, at very different paces, um, leading to uh, a very wide uh, range in, in population outcomes uh, over the next uh, 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 few decades. Um, in parts of the developing world, uh, where fertility has not fallen, mainly sub-Saharan Africa and a scattering of poorer uh, Muslim-majority countries, um, places like uh, Somalia, Sudan, Yemen, uh, Afghanistan. Um, large youth bulges <coughs> will persist uh, uh, well into the 2020s, um, and indeed uh, 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 well beyond that if fertility uh, fails to, to fall uh, in the future as the UN assumes um, um, that it will. Uh, most of these countries have amp amply, <coughs> excuse me, amply demonstrated the correlation uh, between extreme youth and violence uh, in, 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 in recent years. And if that correlation persists, um, um, these regions could remain prone uh, to instability and state failure uh, in, in the future. Um, at the same time, <coughs> Excuse me. At the same time, you have parts of the developing world that are moving through the demographic transition um, at, at a remarkable pace. Uh, in fact, much faster than the developed countries uh, uh, once did um, in, in, in their turn. Uh, China uh, faces a massive um, age wave uh, in, in the 2020s that will arrive uh, while it's still in the midst um, of development and modernization. China has been peacefully rising while demographics, this period of demographic dividend, uh, have been leaning with economic growth. Um, but by the 2020s, uh, its last large generation um, the Red Guard generation will be retiring, um, and the demogra favorable demographics will be thrown into reverse. Old age dependency burdens will soar. Um, imagine tens of millions uh, of today's midlife adults in China, many of whom have joined this vast, rootless, floating, floating population, uh, aging um, by the 2020s into tens of millions of, of indigent elders without pensions, without health care, uh, without uh, children or at least nearby children uh, uh, to, to support them. Um, these trends could, I mean, it, the, the economic rise of China uh, is, is, is often spoken of as, as, as inevitable. Uh, the, these trends could push uh, China uh, in, in, in the direction of social collapse, act as a kind of multiplier on all the stresses of development, or in reaction, uh, cause China to lurch even more towards neo-authoritarianism. Um, is a chart that I that I like to show. I don't know how many of you are aware that by uh, uh, the mid 2030s, at the latest, China will actually be an older country uh, than the United States. Um, meanwhile, uh, Russia will be in the midst of um, the steepest and most projected, protracted population decline uh, of, of, of any country since the plague-ridden uh, uh, Middle Ages. And fertility has collapsed um, um, even as uh, amid a widening health crisis, life expectancy is falling. Uh, the typical Russian male today can expect to live to, to 59, um, which is 16 years less than the typical American male. 
um, and indeed uh, uh, less uh, than Russian men uh, could expect to live on average um, two generations ago at the end of, uh, uh, at the end of World War II. Um, that Putin has called uh, the demo impending demographic implosion of Russia the greatest challenge uh, that the country faces. Um, when, uh, uh, when, it, when a country's uh, geopolitical aspirations uh, are thwarted, uh, it can reach for liberal solutions, and frankly, there's no country in the world today where the demographics are more fundamentally out of whack with the geopolitical aspirations than in Russia. Um, and, and, and then, finally, uh, you have this, this, this curious and interesting phenomenon of backtracking um, um, transitions. When a, uh, uh, when a, when rapid population growth comes to a screeching halt, um, it, it, in other words, when a boom is followed by a bust, it sets up an oscillating uh, sequence of fading echo booms and echo busts into the future. Um, a bust generation uh, is now coming of age uh, in much of the developing world, in Latin America, um, um, South Asia, uh, and in much of the Muslim world. Um, but by the 2020s, uh, an echo boom will follow. Uh, take, 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 take a look at this chart, which uh, depicts the average annual growth rate in the population <laughs> aged 15 to 24. Uh, you can see it decelerating rapidly uh, uh, through, the, through about 2015 to 2020, um, and then uh, suddenly picking up again. Uh, that's the echo boom of the 2020s. Um, this chart shows the cumulative percentage change in the youth bulge uh, age group, uh, the age group 15 to 24, um, in a number of Muslim majority countries, uh, the first bar for the 2010s and the second bar for the 2030s. Uh, you, you can see this, this enormous uh, swing, uh, particularly, um, um, <coughs> excuse me, most dramatically in Iran, uh, where the youth uh, uh, population <coughs> will decline by 31 percent over the next 10 years, um, but then leap upward again by 30 percent over the following 10. Uh, so, so that's the, the, the first caveat is the, the unevenness um, of the tradition, of, of the transition. <coughs> I may have to turn this over to my colleague in a moment if I don't get this uh, uh, cat out of my throat. Um, Uh, at, at the same time, and this, this, is, this is something else we discuss um, in, in the book, um, and, and that's that journeys can be more dangerous than, than, than destinations. Um, it, it, it may be that older age structures, uh, uh, together with development over time, um, push countries towards greater, uh, uh, greater prosperity and greater stability. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily do so in a, a linear fashion. Um, and in fact, there is uh, some evidence that the risk uh, uh, of, of conflict um, rises uh, at first with income before it then falls. So there's a hump-shaped relationship between uh, uh, development and, and conflict. And, and, and this should hardly be surprising. I mean, development economists uh, uh, are, are quite familiar with the fact that development itself uh, uh, gives rise to a whole series of social and economic stresses that, that we see uh, being played out now uh, in different regions of the developing world. I mean, everything from mass internal migration to urbanization to rising income inequality uh, 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 to, to um, growing ethnic tensions um, uh, to environmental degradation. Um, and most of these stressors themselves exhibit a hump-shaped relationship with uh, uh, respect to, to, to development. Um, I mean, there's, there's, there's also uh, some evidence that this relationship is strongest for some of the most serious uh, types of security threats um, um, that we face today particularly international terrorism. Most of the terrorists don't come from the poorest countries. They come from disaffected uh, middle classes and middle income countries. 
um, um, uh, international terrorism, neo-authoritarian reaction, as in the China model or the, the Russian model. Um, th there's also the, the, the problem of uh, demographic competition. I, I think we need to push this towards a, a conclusion, probably. So let me just say a word or, or, or two um, ab about this. When population, when fertility falls and population growth uh, slows, um, um, uh, within a region uh, or within a uh, state, um, it, it doesn't do so uh, at the same rate necessarily for all um, ethnic and religious groups uh, uh, within a given society. Um, um, so you have differential demographic trends, <coughs> often between groups with a long history uh, of, of competition, uh, uh, of, 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 of tension. I mean, Muslims and Hindus in India, Christians and, 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 and Muslims in, in Nigeria, uh, uh, within Islam between Shiites and Sunnis and so forth. So there, there, there's this whole issue of differential uh, growth rates. Um, also within uh, religious traditions, uh, uh, differential fertility and growth rates um, by intensity of religious conviction. Um, it, this is true within, within, within Judaism. It's true within uh, 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 various Christian denominations. I don't know how many of you know that the fertility rate in uh, 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 you know, Red Zone, Utah, is what is it, Neil? Fifty percent higher uh, than in than in Blue Zone, Vermont. You have a huge fertility uh, differential. Um, uh, an interesting survey um, of I, I think a dozen or more Muslim countries uh, uh, asked the question: uh, Should should Sharia uh, only uh, be the law of the land. Um, and among those who answered yes, uh, the fertility rate was twice as high as among those who answered no. Um, so you have a, a sort of a fertility divide between, between more secular and more religious segments of the population, which could affect, um, to the extent that the demographic transition um, um, is, 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 is tied to development and modernization, could actually affect the progression of the transition over time. Uh, gender imbalances in East and South Asia, uh, which is itself in part an artifact of falling fertility. Um, let me just vault over that. We can come back to that uh, 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 afterwards if you want to. Um, and, and finally, this issue of squandered demographic dividends. Um, yes, uh, this, this, this period of demographic dividend can give, give a big boost to economic growth. Um, any number of studies have estimated that, uh, in fact, change, the change in age structure in East Asia accounts for between a quarter uh, uh, and a third um, of the growth rate in per capita GDP, in other words, the living standard growth rate uh, in China and, and the, the tigers uh, over the past uh, three decades. Um, isn't this going to happen everywhere? Well, in fact, most of the developing world is well through the transition. Dependency ratios have been falling in Latin America since uh, uh, the mid-1970s. They've been falling in South Asia. They've been falling in the Muslim world. They've been falling everywhere except sub-Saharan Africa. Um, yet, uh, to date, it's really only East Asia uh, that has fully leveraged um, the, demographic, uh, uh, the demographic dividend. Um, now let me just uh, conclude um, with a couple of words about, about the 2020s and, and this confluence of demographic risks that we see. Uh, for the developed world, it'll be a decade of hyper-aging and population decline, um, as, as, as Neil discussed. Uh, the United States being uh, a partial but important uh, uh, exception. <coughs> The 2020s um, is when the age dependency ratio rises the fastest in most countries. Um, the aging, the underlying trends of falling fertility and rising longevity are given a big extra push by the retirement en masse of post-war baby boom generations. Um, it, it's the decade of uh, the fastest growth in pension uh, and, and health benefit spending. Many countries will face fiscal uh, uh, crises. Um, it's also uh, a decade 
which will see a dramatic flattening uh, in the growth trend uh, in, in, in real GDP. And let me just throw up a chart here that, uh, um, that illustrates the, uh, uh, the point that Neil was making earlier um, about, the growth, about the growth in productivity perhaps not rising fast enough uh, to offset the, declining, uh, uh, the decline in working age populations. Um, ushering in in some of the faster aging parts of the developed world uh, this, this new unprecedented era of secular stagnation. Um, meanwhile, uh, in the developing world, uh, you have uh, this, this whole series of, of potential demographic storms that I, that I just ticked off. Uh, the, the echo booms in the Islamic world, uh, the population implosion in Russia and Eastern Europe. Um, and in China, uh, not just uh, the, what, what, I, what in the book we call uh, it's premature aging, premature because it's happening at a much lower level of per capita income than it's happened anywhere else. Um, but uh, this premature aging uh, coinciding um, with, with, with China's arrival as a, as a final arrival as a middle income country and its overtaking uh, of the United States um, as the world's largest economy, uh, at least measured in, in, in purchasing power parity dollars. Um, and so for, for, for those of you familiar with power transition uh, uh, theory, um, this, this, this could be a moment that, that, that is uh, potentially rife with uh, 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 danger, and so let me stop. Uh, let me stop there. Okay, terrific. Thank you both very much. I think what we'll do is we'll turn it over to Jen for some quick comments, and then have a discussion with everyone here. So, Jen, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you to all the staff at the ECSP. It's nice to fly back into D.C., even if there was some snow waiting for me. Forgot what that was like after six months in Memphis. It's a privilege to talk today about the work being done at CSIS because. You guys, as you know, have really led the way in keeping aging on the agenda of policymakers and kind of putting aging at the forefront. And that's something that I very much appreciate. And I think this book is likely to see similar success with policymakers. Um, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of information here that they will find of use as they continue to think about the world in the future and what things they'll have to pay attention to as they make decisions. I would like to speak today from both an academic and a policy standpoint because I think this book is relevant to both. It's a welcome addition to the literature, um, first of all. As far as I could figure out, I don't really think there's been a comprehensive book on demography and national security for about a decade, I don't think, at least not one of this quality. I think maybe Brian Nietzsche Porks might have been the, the last one. So in that sense, it's really... Um, it's really good to bring the literature up to date and just take stock of what's been going on in the last 10 years or so. Especially a book 10 years ago might not have looked at something like aging in China, whereas today that's much more at the forefront of our thoughts. And I think it's really relevant as well because you take an issue that's near and dear to the hearts of American security planners, and that is population aging. It's relevant not only because the U.S. is aging, but the major allies of the U.S. are aging as well. And so it's something that they certainly care about. So it's a little bit um, of a twist on our typical demography and security connection because it puts aging as the focus. I think there are several strengths of the book. One is, as you mentioned, this d discussion you have about the historical links between population and power. I learned so much from that. And there were very interesting stories about the way that people for centuries have thought about the importance of population. Another major strength, I think, are the um, discussions about fertility and population trends overall. Do a very thorough job of explaining to the layperson what those trends actually mean. And that's something that other books on demography don't necessarily do. Uh, for example, you talk about the assumptions behind the statistics. That's something we don't usually see. We just we read books about demography or articles about demography where we take the statistics they give us for granted, and those of us who know the assumptions behind them usually get all ruffled up. And I completely agree with the ones that you chose. I think you made wise choices with the constant fertility and the high fertility for uh, developing countries. 
and you explain why you chose those, and that's a major strength. As I mentioned, the book really brings us up to date with what's been happening, and I think it lays out a research agenda for ways we can look at the interaction between demography and security. But there are a few things I, th I think that I, I come to different conclusions about. One of the major things is I think you're a bit overconfident in what you term your findings. So the, the, the headline in bold at the end of the book is, these are our findings about demography. The beginning and middle of the book use that really strong language. Um, and that doesn't really match the middle of the book. The middle of the book shows all of the nuances behind um, the research that there are maybe differing viewpoints on something and how you really came to your, I guess, um, not conclusions, but your guesses about what's likely to happen in the future. But then when you turn to the end of the book, it's couched in much stronger language. Instead of such and such is likely to happen, it's that such and such will happen. And I think that disconnects and takes away from the really strong research that you did in the middle of the book. And this is where it connects to policy for me as well. Policymakers like to know what we don't know and what we do know. And with population aging and national security, often there's a lot more of what we don't know than what we do know. That's because the literature is somewhat underdeveloped. Some reasons for that are because population aging is new. Um, some reasons for that is that people are just now paying attention to it. The literature on youth and conflict is much greater, uh, is much more developed than that of aging. But I think we can get around that. And I just want to suggest a couple of, of areas. We have states in the world that have been aging. And if we track at the same time their trends in the military, their economy and their politics, then we can start to see um, what's actually been happening instead of just having to guess what will happen in the future. And so to be able to take the past more and extrapolate out into the future, then I think you can be a bit more confident with the findings. So the one area I'll pick on is the one area, I'm kind of cheating, that I've done most of my research in, and that's social mood. So um, in the end of the book, you talk about <clears throat> these big fears that we have, and we, we hear this often that population aging will lead older electorates to kind of hijack the political agenda, that as they become a larger part of the population, they'll skew policies more in their favor. Well, when you really start to look at what's happened so far, we have Germany, Italy, and Japan, for example, the three most aged states in the world. And we can track, as their populations have aged, what's been happening politically there. Have the older parts of the electorate been joining together and voting in huge blocks in their interests only? Have policies been skewing more to give them more money, um, exclude youth? That's actually not the case. As Germany, Italy, and Japan have aged, policymakers in those states have realized kind of the consequences of previous political decisions that would be extremely generous in terms of health care and pensions and have been scaling back. Another thing and is that it's not always just about reducing or raising the retirement age or reducing pension benefits. If you really begin to dig down into these countries, you see that in Germany, for example, I think it's something like 40% of men exit the workforce through disability schemes, not retirement. So there are a lot of different policy options, more so than just raising the retirement age. And changing the level of analysis a bit from this very high level of analysis where we talk about just developed countries to individual developed countries and recognizing that the particular context matters is important. As far as older electorates voting together, I've found that in Germany and Italy, region is a much greater indicator of a, of a person's vote than their age. So like a 65-year-old in Bavaria, very different interests from a 65-year-old in the north of Germany. So we don't really see this happening yet. It's not to say that we might not in the future, but I think it's important to actually see what's been happening so far in order to be a bit more confident in, in what we suggest for the future. And I think this tells us then that institutions really matter. We sit here in the U.S. where AARP is one of the um, biggest influences on our, our government, some would argue. We'd certainly see them out there a lot. And so we tend to kind of project that model onto the rest of the world. If aging matters here, it must matter in places where they're even more aged. But the United States is unusual because we give interest groups a major um, role to play in our policymaking. 
In other states, that's not necessarily the case. Even in Italy, the unions have been um, opposed by the government several times, and that's kind of the closest model we have with interest groups. So this context, this idea of institutions really matters, I think. Secondly, I think we can use more nuance in our definition of aged. You do a great job of discussing what, it, what fertility means, um, and you also introduce a discussion about life expectancy and some of the research at Max Planck that Jim Vopel and others have done in terms of extending life expectancy. And we know he, he thinks it's going to extend forever. There's some new research by Wolfgang Lutz and other scholars that talks about, or asks the question rather, was a 65-year-old in the year 1900 really the same age as a 65-year-old in the year 2000? Or is there something different about age? We tend to throw things out there like elderly. What does it mean to be elderly? What does it mean to be old? And what they do is they say that um, what if we defined age not by the year you were born, but how, by how many years you have left in life? And it's an interesting thought. I mean, I haven't... It's nothing I've used yet, but I think it's interesting for us in terms of policy to think backwards like that. Um, as some of you may know, the most expensive year of life is the last year of life. Uh, that's where you really start to spend your money. It's where governments start to spend their money. So thinking backwards gives you a different policy perspective and maybe opens up different options. And I think this nuanced discussion of age is really necessary as well when we think about this phrase that so many of us use, old before rich. There's all this concern about countries that get old before they get rich. Well, how does a 65-year-old in the United States differ from a 65-year-old in China or um, a, de a lesser developed country? What kinds of things can we learn if we study places where people have maybe gotten old before the country's gotten rich? Some more studies on Eastern Europe and Russia, for example, might help us learn more about what could happen in China. And Finally, I just want to talk a bit about how policymakers that I have seen, just in my limited experience, are likely to use this information. First of all, I think they'll love it because they love to uh, learn about age. Robert Gates, as we know, has just been talking about Russia's declining population and the importance of that. And what the book does well is take stock of a range of issues for policymakers to consider. What I'd love to see more um, in the future is the way that these trends interact with other trends. There's some discussion in here about the environment, for example. I think that's the direction policy is moving at, at DOD, and other, and, um, at least, is looking at the way that demographic trends interact with other trends. And what factors would change your conclusions about aging? So I've talked a little bit about the need for maybe a subnational context. But what about a supranational context? What about this global recession? Does that change any of your conclusions about aging? Or maybe a large-scale international war? Or a trend in terrorism? Does that, do any of those factors matter? And lastly, I think going into the future, we need more of an emphasis on places where policymakers can make a difference. That opportunities matter just as much as challenges. And so pointing out for them places that they can have a positive impact in mitigating the effects of trends are really important. But I think it's an excellent book, and thank you very much for the opportunity to sit here with you. Thank you very much, Jen. Richard, Neil, thank you. Uh, you've given us an awful lot. I think why don't we get uh, some questions, and um, I, I know there are um, lots of people in the audience here who've worked these issues. I think they'll probably have questions from all sorts of different angles, so it may... Um, uh, go in lots of different directions, but why don't we do that and then give uh, Neil and Richard and, and Jen an opportunity to respond. So can we start with Martin Walker up here and then we'll move around. So John up here in the front. Somebody who's written a little bit about these issues. Um, Martin Walker, the Global Business Policy Council. Uh, I noted that most of your, uh, your data base was 2000 to 2005 for the developed, for, for the developed world. And I wondered what impact you thought the remarkable recent shifts in, in birth rates in Western Europe and Northern Europe in particular have been having. We've got the highest birth rate in Germany for 18 years. We've got the French getting above replacement level, a TFR of above, uh, above 2.1 last year. 
France overtaking Ireland as the highest birth rate in, in Europe. We've got the British government now calculating a population of about 75 million from today's 60 million uh, within about 35 years. There, there seems to have been, oh, and, and also what's been called in Scotland, uh, my own country, the, the mini baby boom. Something seems to have been in changing in the, um, in the, in the water there in, in Northern Europe. And I wonder what that will do. The, the, the second point is some assessments I've been doing on, on what looks like the, the current very sharp slowdown in East Asia would suggest that this uh, China's decade of uh, GDP parity, even on a PPP basis, is going to be delayed about 20 years. Okay. Shall I? Uh... Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, on, on, the, on the fertility uh, uh, issue in in Europe, um, we we tried as we were writing the book to, you know, look at the latest data uh, as it was becoming uh, uh, available. Uh, there clearly has been a very significant increase in fertility in in France, um, um, uh, part par par part of which, uh, and I think we 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 looked at these numbers and 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 and. Uh, fa fairly closely, Neil. C correct me if I'm correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but a, a, a significant part of which uh, uh, was due to to higher uh, uh, to an actual increase in Muslim fertility. Is that uh, uh, is that correct? Um, but but there has been no. Well, That's we could. Absolutely We've looked at the looked at the INED reports also. We 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 can knock our heads together on this this. But all, all, all also, I mean, there 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 is Frankie. My, my my wife is 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 French, so I confess to some, you know, pot possible bias here. But but they've been remarkably uh, uh, successful um, um, in uh, e enabling. Uh, 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 parents, and particularly women, uh, uh, to balance jobs and families. It, it's been a long-term project in France. Um, so this certainly has been a, 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 an increase there. E e even, even so, it, it's an increase within a fairly, fairly narrow range. I think France bottomed out around 1.65 or 1.7, and it's now up to, 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 to replacement. Um, uh, Germany, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure on. Um, um, I, I don't. As we wrote this book, I, I I wasn't aware of any dramatic shift in 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 the total in the total fertility rate in in in, in Germany. But that certainly bears watching, be, because uh, uh, Ger Germany has been at a very low rate for a long time, and I I, I think that what's sometimes called the tempo effect has, has probably worked its way through there already. So if we're seeing a shift in Germany, that would be very interesting. Um, uh, Neil, do you want to comment on the? Um, but but in, in, in any case, I as yet see you know no 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 no, no evidence of a you know a, a dramatic uh, uh, up, upward shift uh, towards uh, 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 replacement or above replacement uh, fertility uh, outside of a few of these these countries that have were already in Europe's high fertility zone, uh, France, the UK. Um, um, Scandinavia, uh, the Low Countries. Um, if there is real significant movement in Germany, that would be that would be interesting. Do you want do you want to talk to the? Do you have anything to add on that, or talk to the GDP issue? Uh, in in China. Oh well, <laughs> yeah, that it's certainly been scaled back. They're no longer talking about ten plus uh, percent per year, are they? Um, We'll have to see. We'll also have to see what the global recession has, whether it has an impact on fertility itself. Uh, not just in those countries. And another interesting case where we're seeing a real resurgence, according to the latest data on fertility, is Russia, which they're taking a great pride in. And of course, they have a lot of youth groups running around now, you know, trying to, trying to do everything they can to um, uh, push younger people to have babies at all costs. Uh, I think we are seeing a, a, a kind of a pro-natalist wave uh, across much of of Europe, including Russia now, and and uh, I think it's interesting how policy is often more reflective of the mentality of these societies than necessarily what's causing 
the actual uh, change in behavior. Uh, but as I think you will admit, it's early. We'll, we'll see what happens to it. So. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm slow my job. Yeah, Sean, thank you. You're helping me, and then we'll go to Eric. Just take um, notes. Interesting stuff. I'm Paul Holmes with, uh, with USAID, work on health programs in Europe and Eurasia. Um, I'm just curious if you could give us some sort of sense of what your research suggests for policymakers and programming of international health assistance. As you know, we traditionally focus on um, pregnant women and lactating women. We focus on uh, children under five. We focus on infectious diseases. Um, sort of uh, proscriptively, what does this um, what does this suggest as to uh, the types of things that we should focus on? Should we continue to, to you know, basically stay the course and uh, make sure that the very youngest survive? Uh, or should there be uh, an increased focus on um, helping those who are already working stay productive longer? Or should it be some combination of, of the two? Thank you. Well, I think given the, uh, the correlation between all, all kinds of positive development indicators and the good health of children, uh, uh, not just that, but even uh, indicators such as state failure and civil unrest, even amazingly with the uh, health of small children, uh, that what you're doing is the right thing. <laughs> I don't know what you're asking, if there's some alternative except uh, keeping children healthy. Uh, is, there, is there some an alternative policy you had in mind? or? Well, AIDS is a special case, and uh, 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 because of the because of the age bracket that it, it affects, you don't you don't want entire villages being raised by grandparents and so on. And I mean that's a special case, uh, but I think in general uh, mortality is is very high in those early years. Uh, it, just just by by nature, you know, it's rigged that way, and 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 uh, increasing health of kids has just a high. Uh, a, a high correlation with good things happening in those societies is is all I can say. Isn't isn't that what the the, the data that I've seen seems to suggest? So well, ab, 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 absolutely, I above all the obvious economic reasons. I mean, these are there's investment. These are kids early on in life, and and everything you can do to help them become productive later on will benefit the society. So. I, I I suppose a secondary fo focus and that I, in, in Especially in this particular case of AIDS, is is is, is young adult mortality, um, be, because that so greatly undermines incentives to uh, uh, to, to to invest in, in human capital and and and, and, and education. But um, um, I think that's. But but it's a it's a good question you put on there and one that kind of hearing you or your colleagues discuss about what does the you look at the what are folks dying from it's the developed and developing country lists are looking awfully similar more and more similar and so what does that mean for a place like aid and investment in health and so on? it's a very good question one that we should certainly take up here Eric I know you have to run to a meeting so Eric Kaufman yeah. when we get to your hi Eric so. Kaufman at University of London and also Harvard. I, I very much enjoyed the presentation. I want to also say that I think it is important to sort of get at some of these big picture trends which bring together aging and ethnic change. And so I actually salute that. Maybe it's because I'm an academic, so I like the more frivolous questions. But I, I want to push that a little bit further, the big picture. And because in your book, which I found extremely interesting, you talk a bit about the classical period and other historical periods. Uh, and this whole connection between uh, demography and dominant ideologies, for example, we know that the demographic transition population explosion coincided with liberalism, with the Enlightenment, with a whole set of ideas. And I'm wondering if we're entering as a world this period of population contraction and maybe looking back to the classical period, I mean, what do you see as 
possible ideologies that might develop in that kind of an environment? Uh, if anyone's interested in this discussion, is it chapter one, I think, where we do right. that? Chapter one of the book, uh, really looking at sort of the history of thinking about population policy. And one of the things that, that certainly occurred to us, uh, looking back over, you know, not only the centuries, but even the millennia, back to, uh, you know, what Hammurabi, for instance, was doing in his, in his law code having to do with fertility. Were those the first pro-fertility incentives that we, we ever saw? But one thing is clear among all of the historians, the intellectual historians who have studied this uh, subject, is that from the beginning of time, or certainly the beginning of, of, uh, of, of recorded history, and we started having some record of what leaders said about this, there has been an almost uniform fixation on what's called populationism, right? Higher birth rates uh, 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 or uh, uh, higher survival uh, or in, enlarging your population either by immigration or emigration. And this was a fixation that, with very few exceptions, until uh, the, the middle of the, of the 18th century, when we had the beginning of the demographic transition in the West, when suddenly, instead of a high mortality, high fertility society, we became a low mortality, high fertility society, and we started seeing these incredible uh, population growth rates throughout most of the West. Uh, then suddenly, Malthus became very popular. And uh, not only that, we looked at other instances. For instance, the interesting story of France, uh, whose population stopped growing almost entirely after the middle of the 19th century, uh, largely blamed their defeat in the Franco-Prussian War on the fact that they didn't have as many soldiers as, as Germany. Uh, and uh, uh, senators were getting up in the 1890s in France and saying, why if French women had the same number of children as German women, why we would have 50,000 more soldiers. There is not a single popular Malthusian uh, in France from the 1860s on, uh, virtually up until you know, the post-war period. And it's fascinating to me to look at both periods and places and to see the amazing association between population growth and wealth. When you think about it, that's kind of obvious in a way. Uh, but now that, that so, many of the play, so many areas in the world are, in, are entering this, this condition of po either population decline or population stability, we see increasing uh, of, you know, what's called population fear or a, a, a fear of declining population. There was an interesting study done by, uh, I hate to say obscure academics, but I've never seen it cited anywhere else. So, you know, I say obscure because I never, but, I, but I, I found it was fascinating. Actually looked at media articles on population uh, over the past 20 years throughout the developed world. And they found that the extent of the negative portrayal of population decline and low fertility uh, was almost perfectly associated with the inversely proportional to the fertility rate in that country. In other words, the lower the fertility rate, the more any discussion of population de decline was portrayed uh, uh, negatively. In the United States, where we've had the least you know, decline in fertility, and, and certainly we've, we're at the replacement rate, and with immigration, we will, we, will have, we will continue to expand demographically as far as we can see. We have had the fewest depictions in the media of uh, population decline or population stasis as a negative thing. And the most depictions of it is, you know, good for the environment and good for all kinds of things, you know, to have fewer people around. So anyway, that was fascinating to me too. So uh, just a little bit of reflections on your comment. When we make our way around, and sorry, I'm, I'm not trying to ignore that side of the room, but we're, we'll, we'll get to you. So, sir, right there. Thank you. I didn't understand. You sure. If you could let us know who you are. Well. Uh, my name is Ron Levin. I didn't understand how the conversation between Martin Walker and the other gentlemen in the panel came out in terms of what was causing, whether Muslim birth rates were causing uh, the increasing birth rates in Western Europe. And I don't think you all discussed it at all, maybe it's not part of your, your subject, what those increasing Muslim birth rates might cause to the balance of populations in Europe, the economies in Europe, and you know, you can track it all off. And last, just a short one. It says, for the Islamic world, echo boom decade. I thought that if you were going to have an echo boom, you had to have a period in which there was a decline so that you could see the, a rise. My understanding was there was just a rise in population without an echo along the way. Thank you. The, 
The echo boom and bust, uh, we, we, I, I have no idea whether that applies to Muslims in Western Europe. I've never even thought well, that's, of that. That's there. It says for Muslim world, echo boom decade. Yeah, well, oh. there's separate that's kinds of questions. One I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. Western Europe, and then the second has to do with your bullet about for the Islamic world. Why does it refer to an echo boom decade if the trend is straight up, which is my understanding? It's not. It's not. It's not straight up. And, and part of the confusion may be that um, um, when I was talking about stalled uh, uh, transitions, I flagged sub-Saharan Africa, where fertility remains very high, and a scattering of Muslim countries, where it remains very high. But in fact, in most of the Muslim world, fertility has come down very significantly and very substantially. And in some countries, it has absolutely collapsed. Yes. Fertility in Iran, for instance, fell from well over six, uh, 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 perhaps 6.5 in 1980, just after the revolution, to essentially replacement today. Um, so it, when you have a decline that, that steep, um, it, you, you, you put an enormous break uh, on the growth rate um, in, the, uh, 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 in the population, I um, mean, in the youth population, and you set up, it's called Sun's Law for, for anyone who's interested. <laughs> the, that a, a, after a 19th century Norwegian demographer who first observed yeah. this, that, that, that a population boom followed by a bust sets up this. this the, 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 well, the reason is, is that when you, when you think about it, when you have the, uh, each, each, <laughs> You know, each cohort of children, say, twice as large as the last, right? If that's suddenly broken, okay, the, the children who are not yet mature are still going to be growing and having a lot more kids, right? So you suddenly have a lot fewer children, but then you have an, another boom as the previous children who were born go on and have kids, and you have this o oscillation take place. Where I think Rich's point was that when you have the, 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 mo the more sudden the decline, the more exaggerated the sunt uh, echo boom. And we see that, in fact, because I think in your figures, you saw that Iran was the most dramatic echo, precisely because Iran has had, I think, in the, in the 20th century, the singest, fastest fertility decline of, of any country I think we've seen. Um, should should I we address the first point that was well, raised on? I, I think because I want to make sure that we're uh, fair to everybody else. I think is it fair to summarize that we have different I, I recollections and we, we need to sort it out so we don't know the answer. Yeah. There's a dispute. We can talk about yeah, it afterwards. Later. It's, a, it's certainly an interesting question worth clarifying. Uh, we had, um, sorry. Why don't we start to collect a couple and do it? So we have uh, Dick and Liz and the gentleman in the back of the table and the lady in the white has been very patient as well. So I apologize. And, back okay we got lots and uh, yes. thank, thank you dick smith um i wanted to have you comment a little more if you would on, a, on an issue that may not have so much in the way of, of precedent that is the, the gender imbalance question not only specifically china where you have a policy driven problem if it if it is a problem and to what extent it's a problem of, of many more males and females and a group of males who won't have the opportunity to marry and start families and also the question of as technology becomes more accepted that allows gender selection, is this a looming problem in the population area? Okay, Dick, if you don't mind, we're going to take a couple and then give you guys a chance to respond. So if you could hand it just to Liz Leahy right there. Liz Leahy, Population Action International. Um, if you don't mind, I have two questions. One, a quick follow-up on the echo boom. Um, I just wanted to make the point, to, to continue on the gentleman's earlier question, that I, I think from your numbers, the growth that will be experienced in the decade of the, the boom will, at, will lead the total young adult population to still be smaller than it is today. So when we hear the term echo boom, it's easy to think a dramatic increase, we're going to see another youth bulge, but it, the, the percentage of the youth population will still be smaller than it is today, which I just think is an important point to keep in mind. Second, to follow up on some of Jennifer's comments and some of the early, earlier ones on policy, I know you said you didn't have time during your presentation to touch on any of your policy recommendations. Um, I know 
sure our time remains limited, but I'd be fascinated to hear what those are, both for developed countries where, as you pointed out, aging has been taking place for at least 30 years. We've had some time to prepare for it. Um, would you relate aging at all to the current economic recession? Do you think we haven't quite yet reached the tipping point, or maybe we have? And then what, if any, role do developed countries have um, through their foreign policy or specifically their foreign aid in a shaping demographic factors in developing countries? Thanks. Okay, and then the gentleman at the back of the table will do one more and then give every... Uh, Carlos Indacochea, the George Washington University. I'd just like to offer an alternative view of the institutional arrangement uh, on aging uh, in Europe vis-a-vis -vis the United States. I mean, my feeling is that AARP has a role in the United States precisely because uh, the public instance, the state, does not provide um, quality arrangements for the elderly as it does in Western Europe. So there's a lot of room to wiggle and represent, in, supposedly represent interest groups. So ARP, to the extent that it has failed as a lobbying group to attain the levels of attention that the elderly have in Europe, uh, they are going to be able to keep selling their insurance, their, their walking canes, and their cruises. <laughs> okay, terrific. Why don't we give the panel an opportunity to respond to, we had Dick's question about the yeah, Sex ratio yeah, and send, 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 send a, a, I could say a word about gender imbalance, and maybe you could talk about the policy. Um, very good, yeah. The, uh, I mean, the, 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 the skewed sex ratios, um, of course, are, are, aren't, I mean, uniquely an artifact of, 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 of policy. We see this in India uh, as well. Um, we saw it uh, in a big way in South Korea uh, in, in, until recently. Um, um, but but, but n n nonetheless, it, it does appear uh, in, 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 in China that it is related to the one-child policy. Um, if you look, the sex ratio at birth in China is about 118. Uh, to, to 100 now, uh, boys for girls. And in a normal population, it's 105 or 106 to 100. Um, but if you disaggregate that by birth order, uh, uh, you see something very interesting, uh, 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 startling, um, in fact, which is that for the first child, uh, it is only a little bit higher than uh, a normal ratio. It's 107 or 108. But for the second and third children, it's a hun up around 150 uh, to 100. So, so in, a, in a low fertility environment um, with penalties uh, 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 attached uh, uh, to, to contravening the, uh, uh, the, 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 the policy, um, parents let nature take its course the first time, but the second time they, they go out of their way to ensure uh, that it's a uh, uh, that it that it's a boy, and, and this is indeed. I mean, this has been written about as a a potential security issue. You have all these testosterone charged surplus bachelors without the, you know, the domesticating influence uh, uh, of a of, of of a marriage in a society in which the expectation of marriage is universal. You know, Nick Aberstadt at AEI uh, t talks about. Um, the institution of honorable bachelorhood that the West developed, which simply does not exist uh, in Confucian East Asian societies. But, but we, we also think there's um, um, another uh, potentially uh, very worrisome um, implication of the gender imbalance that directly feeds back into the aging challenge. And, and, and there, there's a perverse irony here. Um, one of the reasons for the skewed gender balance is that in these cultures, it's the son that has the responsibility for caring for the aged parents. But it's not the son that does the caring, is it? It's the poor tyrannized over daughter-in-law. Um, so you're, 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 you're actually, you actually see in these gender imbalances the makings of a huge caregiving crisis in the future. Uh, in, in China um, and in India. Neil? It, just to follow up a little bit on that, um, it, it's been pretty well demonstrated that there's always been a gender imbalance, that this is a, this is a um, one dimension of sort of patrilocal family structure where the 
daughter leaves the family and, and joins the family of the husband. And that, and that we have, most scholars have seen in northern India and most of the Confucian culture, most of you know, Han culture in China, they've seen this uh, even going way back in the 19th century, long before one-child families and long before uh, contraception technology. So it was probably always there. But obviously, the combination of of technology, because there's now you know ultrasound technology in even the most remote villages now in China, plus the one-child policy, has made the problem much more severe. One one other interesting sidelight on this is that in in China this is called the bare branches problem, because another aspect of this patrilocal marriage is that the the well the the daughter has to go serve the husband, but in return the daughter always gets to marry up socially. Okay, that's how it works. So, and the problem with the uh, with the with the daughters of rajas in, in northern India is that they have no one to marry, <laughs> so they end up living their life alone. But everyone marries up, uh, and so the bare branches is the fact that it's the lowest status males, right? These these uh, these shadow armies of the unemployed now in in China, the people at the bottom who have no one to marry, and that that accentuates this problem of of unattached males. They aren't just unattached males, they're unattached males at the bottom, right? The lowest branches uh, with, without, without leaves, I guess that's what you're supposed to think of. Um, uh, I agree with your point on the, on the boom, the boomlet. Yes, it's a, it's a relative boomlet, but it's obviously less than the first boom. It, it's, a, it's a declining wave over time, kind of like an echo. Well, it's kind uh, of when the stock market, you know, f falls 60%, right? You have to the, what, go, you, go back up more than sixty percent to to to, to, to be more than that. Uh, don't we all analogy. know about that? We, we can show you the. Uh, we may not have time now, but if you're interested, in it we can sh I, we can show you go through at least our policy points. I mean, if you're interested in taking a look here, um, th this point about AARP is interesting, and I I know uh, Jennifer, you raised this whole point about about policy changes, and I don't know if you might have something to say about this, Rich. Um, uh, Europe and Japan uh, have passed policies, uh, have passed reforms uh, to, uh, to cut back on the cost of these, uh, of these uh, senior programs. But these, for the most part, these policies have not yet had any effect. So the interesting question is, of course, whether the electorate, they look great now because the politicians can say, we solved the problem. Look at these projections, you know, we're clear. Uh, the problem, though, is whether once these policies actually begin to bite, whether the populations will go around. Remember that in, in, in most of Europe, unlike, unlike the United States, unlike many of the English-speaking countries, there is very little next to nil private sector preparation for retirement. So the elderly are almost entirely dependent upon these pay-as-you-go transfer payment programs. Um, it's true that they're not politically represented by AARP, but they are represented through uh, through the unions and through the political parties, which have an active wing dedicated to, you know, making sure that these, you know, programs stay beyond controversy. Um, as you know, many of these countries, not the least France, has, has governments have fallen through just mentioning reform in these programs. We certainly saw that more than once in the 1990s. Uh, what we did, and I think it's important to emphasize, what we did in our projections was to project that the same that the, that the same level of benefits per capita overall would continue to go to the, to the seniors. And, and what we suggested that then any cut beneath that was, was a cut. I mean, would, would someone would have to take a political hit for that. Do you have we, anything we, to add for that? Well, exactly. We, we developed what we call a, a, a current deal or a cost pressure projection in which we assume that, that retirement age remains unchanged. Um, and, and that per capita benefits relative to per worker wages remain unchanged um, so that we can look at the magnitude of the required adjustments in the future. Um, and, and Jennifer is absolutely right, and as Neil mentioned, that a number of European countries uh, have, 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 have enacted uh, uh, prospectively um, um, uh, uh, very significant cuts uh, uh, in, in, in benefits. This is the case in Italy though they uh, 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 grandfathered uh, uh, anyone now um, over about the age of 35. Um, it, it's, it's the case uh, uh, to some extent in Germany uh, with their new demographic stabilizer. Um, um, it's certainly the case in Japan, uh, uh, which is the one country where um, 
the, the cuts have actually begun to bite uh, uh, deeply. Um, but the point, the, point, the point is, that to come back to, to, to Neil's remark about the high level of elder dependence um, on, on, on these public transfers, it, for, for the median household in most continental European countries, between three quarters and four fifths of income comes in the form of a government check. And, and in a country like France, that's true up into the fourth quintile. So it's only at very high levels that, that you have alternative sources of income. Um, and these countries are doing very little to fill in that gap. The projections imply a huge relative decline in the living standard of the elderly. And one has to ask whether that's politically plausible. I sometimes say that they've, they've to pick up on what Neil said, that you know, they've solved the projections. They haven't solved the problem. Anyway. Well, I would just add one thing, and I think you're right that um, absolutely about the retirement. And that's why sometimes I think we can learn more by looking at different kinds of policies than just that one retirement age. For example, in my research, I actually looked at unemployment policy. Mm -hmm. And in Germany, for example, unemployment policy uh, was so generous to the oldest cohorts. And yet uh, reforms were passed that took away those benefits. And those have actually been in place so far. That's true. So that's a good that's a good laboratory for us to study. How does the elderly react, or how do older cohorts react when they do have something taken away? Because with retirement, we're not really sure. And when we did see a little bit of switching around, I think in terms of political parties at the state level in Germany, um, the left, for example, tended to win more. They tend to focus more on the elderly um, cohorts. But at the same time, that region was still a bigger indicator because. Um, mm -hmm. Groups didn't rally around age as much as we might expect. So I think in future research, since retirement is so hairy, maybe there are other issues of interest to, the, to older cohorts that could tell us something about the way that they react at the polls. You also mentioned the issue of health and whether we, we, you know, we're living healthier longer and whether it would not be painful to adjust retirement age. And I think that's obviously a good question. Um, Polls have shown that it's not good to put reform as an increase in the retirement age. No one likes the government to tell them when they ought to retire. So typically what they do is they simply scale down the, what's called the full benefit and just allow people to make their own choice of how little a benefit they want to get, right? If they want to retire early, they still can. They just won't get as much money. But however you bill it, however you market it, it's going to be a decline in benefit. Uh, the interesting thing you raised about wellness is... is uh, a fascinating one, and one that's interested us uh, due to recent research we've done uh, with the CDC on obesity. Uh, obesity is the one trend which is pushing in the other way, uh, pushing against increasing wellness. And it has a strong cohort effect. Basically, people today in their mid-50s and younger, certainly in North America, and certainly a little bit younger in, in Europe and other, other developed countries, are showing, along with increased obesity, increased uh, rates of chronic disability stemming from obesity. Uh, there was a recent article in, uh, 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 I believe it was JAMA, one of the two uh, journals of medicine, about two years ago showing that if, if today's obesity increases for the cohort, which is now in their childhood years and teen years, we could see a decline of two to four years in average life expectancy due to all of the, all of the things, cardiovascular diseases and diabetes and everything which is associated with that. Um, I do think that we have seen declining, uh, declining disability rates among the old, but for the first time we're seeing a higher disability rate among the cohort that is about to enter old age. And it's going to be fascinating to see whether or not we see a reversal in disability rates and whether in fact it is true that every subsequent cohort of elderly will be healthier than the last. If we see a reversal in that, that will even put more pressure, pressure on the system, both in health care expenses and obviously uh, 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 cash assistance as well to these it's people. It's also important to bear in mind that, that disability isn't the same thing as morbidity. Um, and, and there is a well-documented and, and, and undisputed uh, uh, decline in the United States and across uh, s any number of developed countries um, over the past 20, 25 years in rates of disability uh, among, among the elderly, uh, as measured by w what are called activities, limitations on activities of daily, of daily living. Um, but the literature that actually looks at the incidence of chronic morbidity comes to a somewhat different conclusion, rates of hypertension, diabetes, 
um, arterial uh, 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 sclerosis, um, et cetera, are, are flat or even rising slightly at the same time. So uh, what does this imply? If functional health is improving, um, um, perhaps, perhaps because we're spending so much on health care, right? Grandma's getting around better because she's taking her pills and she's seeing, seeing the doctor. So this is unambiguously an individual and a social good, but the long-term implications of this, of this trend for the uh, public fisc and the burden on future generations isn't entirely clear. Um, it, it should facilitate the much needed increase in retirement ages, though. Um, the lady in white was waiting a long time. I think she's over here now. We get her and then link and then come over here. Yeah, so please. Yeah, my question was about the echo um, booms also in the Arab states. I went out and I read the paragraph in your book about it, so I think I understand better. But I still have a question, which is, I, well, sorry, my name is Jennifer. I work for USAID in the Middle East uh, Bureau, and I work on family planning, so it's quite relevant to me. The implication of the echo boom, I'm wondering, can fertility practices or the um, programming for family planning affect the, the depth or the, the level of those? Uh, it it certainly can, uh, and in fact, the original fertility uh, a fall in Iran was a was a government orchestrated fall. Iran, after the revolution, was adamantly against any kind of fertility control. Suddenly shifted, I, I believe, even in the midst of the war with Iraq, while the war with Iraq was still going on. Anyway, they they decided to change course, particularly once the war was over, and pushed it and became very have become very sort of we would call liberal proponents of, of family planning and allow women uh, uh, very easily to enter clinics and get whatever kinds of advice they want. And that really hugely accentuated the fertility decline. So there's no question that what you do ha has a big impact. Whether you do it well or whether you don't do it uh, uh, clearly has an impact. Okay. Link, and then we'll come over here. <clears throat> My name is Lincoln Day. I'm a retired demographer. Uh, I'm the author of a book that was published 17 years ago by Routledge in London and in New York entitled uh, The Future of Low Birth Rate Populations. Um, you haven't gotten into policy. You hinted at some of these things in the end of this discussion. I wish uh, you'd gotten into it sooner. I'd like to make a, a couple of comments. I think for policy making, it would help if you were not so narrowly economic in your definition of production and of cost. Uh, Dr. Scrabia, uh, Scraba, Shuba. Shuba, I'm sorry, I don't have my glasses on for this. <laughs> it's tough either way. I'm sorry. Uh, it's a nice name anyway. <laughs> um, has has um, suggested as much. Um, you define age as 65 and over, and it's been suggested that perhaps it ought to be defined in uh, quite different terms, and not necessarily in terms of years. Um, but also, uh, this idea that if you're not in the labor force, somehow or other you're not productive. If it's not something you can get paid for, or somebody can pay you money for, it doesn't count. And Years ago, in 1966, I guess it was, my wife and I, with our two little children, uh, happened to be in Denmark, and our son noticed that they seemed to have a very interesting babysitting system in Denmark, and he labeled it the grandmother system. Now, at the age of seven, he was able to do that. Uh, he had a certain sociological insight, I think, uh, to this. I haven't seen any economists do that. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of economic productivity, things that in other countries would be charged for, uh, that, is, that is produced by older people, retired people. The assumption that, uh, I think we have to get over this idea that people are productive only if they're in the workforce. I think we've seen a lot of people who are in the workforce at very high wages who are <laughs> counterproductive. We've had a very good look at that lately. Um, so I, I would like to, to uh, suggest a little broader idea of production and cost, 
With reference to how expensive it is in old age, um, it's been suggested, that it's been noted, that the cost of care is very high in the last year of life. You bet it is. Because in an industrialized medical system, you pay through the nose for everything and you get everything put in just before you're about to die. I refer in my book to a study that was done in the University of Pennsylvania that showed that doctors, even though all of the data pointed to the fact of imminent death within a few days, were still, were still administering very expensive um, drugs for curative purposes. Uh, death, whenever it occurs in an, in an industrialized system like ours, is expensive. It occurs, if it occurs when you're a kid in, a high, in an accident in high school, it occurs before you've had much chance to produce anything in the society of an economic nature that would enable you to be taken care of maybe at a later age if you died. And one of the great achievements of modern life is that we have postponed death. When, whatever that age is, in the modern technological <clears throat> medical system like that in the United States, it's expensive. Whether it's one year old or 101 years old. Thank you, Link. I think we're going to have one time for one so, final comment, and then we'll give the just uh, just one. Okay, you, if you want to do that quickly, but we just have one more okay. question, and then right, we'll have to ahead. end the session. Give you all a final chance. So, ma'am, please. Okay, I'm going off on a quite different direction. My name is Mindy Reiser. I'm doing consulting for the American Psychological Association. Um, a counter to some of the economic focus. <clears throat> There's a whole other area that you simply alluded to, and that's the diaspora relations, and for an interesting example, the growth of the Indian American community, and now the back and forth to some of the technological centers in India, and the increasing presence in the American political system, the governor of Louisiana, uh, support for political parties by wealthy Indian American industrialists. So there's a whole very interesting dynamic here in terms of U.S. immigration policy, the continuing relations with the political system back home, and some of those systems, i.e. the White Tiger, a brilliant fictional portrayal of a great deal of corruption within Indian political life. These things have implications, have transferabilities. So there are a whole lot of very interesting issues with the diaspora populations that are embedded in politics back home. I heard from a Sri Lankan who was active politically there, has been active here. What's being transferred? What kind of impacts? What kind of standards of public life? These are interesting things and have implications. Um, I, I agree with you. What uh, Turkish politicians running for office campaigning in Germany or uh, Mexican politicians campaigning in, in the Southwest here. I mean, uh, uh, if lower fertility rates associated with an increasing immigration rate, and these immigrations tend to come from certain, certain areas, uh, you're going to have an increasing amount of political activity which concerns other countries going on within your boundaries. So there's no question about that. And we do have some discussion of that uh, in, in our book. Um, I just wanted to, to respond here to the comment about, um, about doing important things that aren't for pay. And I obviously totally agree. As a matter of fact, most of the things we really enjoy doing usually are the things we don't do for pay. Um, the, the problem is it would be great if, if someone wanted to retire and be a grandparent. It would be great if we could tax it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you see, that's the problem. Uh, is the people who decide to retire and become grandparents, they don't pay any FICA anymore. Okay, And this, this is the issue in terms of political economy we deal with. Uh, and it turns out that societies which tend to work less for pay are very often high-tax societies. Uh, there are several uh, uh, studies that came out recently showing that the French actually do work as much as Americans. They just do things like prepare food and so on. They don't, they don't pay each other to do it. They do it themselves. That way they don't get taxed doing it. Um, and, uh, for example, self-assembled self furniture. Uh, the rate of uh, uh, purchases of these goes up in high-tax societies versus low-tax societies. In other words, various ways of, of getting people to do things outside the paid, uh, the, the, the paid economic system uh, is, is fine, except it creates a political economy problem when you can't tax it. You see, when you're 
when you're in the paid labor force, you're taxed, and thereby you support the young. And when you're not, you don't. And I think uh, uh, that's the problem. There's nothing wrong with doing things very valuable, not for pay. It's that it's that they don't contribute to this political uh, the political economy of pay as you go programs that we've set up. Richard, Jen, any final words? Okay. Well, I think we will um, we'll actually end on time for once. Um, I would uh, I thank you very much. It's been terrifically um, helpful. It's really been kind of across the board in lots of different ways. Obviously, lots of different dynamics at play. Um, a couple of kind of advertisements. One is that we will have video and slides and and summary and such on the the website for this meeting. Uh, we also have coming very soon, within a week or two, uh, a new report that has six essays, five essays, six essays on demography and security, including one by Jen Chuba, Rich Sincata, Liz Leahy, Jack Goldstone, who's not here, but a number of people who are in the room, uh, Henrik Erdahl from Norway and such. So we uh, hope to give you some more fodder um, on, on these issues uh, in the future. Um, but. Why don't we join join me please in, in thanking our panelists for really a very interesting discussion today. <laughs>